Hey everyone, before we get to this video, I just had an announcement for you guys. I partnered up with a YouTuber named Malcolm Punch uh, to do a Halo Infinite Legendary run. Uh, I love Halo, as you guys know, and Malcolm Punch is a very, very good friend of mine. So when he asked if I wanted to do a playthrough of Halo Infinite's campaign on Legendary once co-op came out, I signed on without hesitation. Um, we do talk about the lore and the story of Halo Infinite a little bit, but for the most part, it's just two idiots trying to find their way through this campaign. If that intrigues you guys at all, there will be a link to Malcolm's channel in the description, uh, so hopefully you guys enjoy that. But without further ado, let's get to the video you actually clicked on. The Force is strong with you. A powerful Sith you will become. So I was looking through the comments of our video comparing the stories of Rogue One and Halo Reach, and I read one that said the UNSC would be on the same side as the Empire if they were to ever cross over. At first I thought that could potentially be true, but the more I thought about the stories that are told by those individual IPs and how each faction is portrayed, the less likely I thought it would be. The user who made the comment and I ended up getting into a cordial debate over it, and I thought that it would make for a rather interesting video, which is why we're here today. Uh, the debate itself was a fun exercise in each of our understandings of the UNSC and the Empire, so hopefully you all enjoy what I have to say on it. After you watch the video, feel free to join the debate by telling me what you think in the comment section. Commenting and liking the video really helps boost it in the algorithm, so you would be supporting the channel by giving your opinion below. If you do enjoy the video, please consider subscribing for more reviews and analysis on popular games, television shows, and movies. But without further ado, I am your host Jacob, and this is why the UNSC is not the Empire, and why they would not be on the same side. Now there is a wide array of things we could look at to compare and contrast these two factions, so let's narrow that focus down to the points that Holy Knight used to say that they are the same and go from there. The argument goes that if the Empire were to discover the Halo universe just before or during the Battle of Reach, they would side with the UNSC. The reason being that the Empire would see a kindred spirit in a military organization that is fighting both human insurrectionists and aliens, since the Empire is also fighting a rebellion and has a strong air of human supremacy in its elites. As this aid went on, the UNSC would essentially become an appendage of the Empire, and Lord Hood becomes a grand moth of UEG space, since both organizations are morally defunct. The Empire would help the UNSC win the war against the Covenant, and then both would ride off into the sunset to assist each other in crushing the rebellion and insurrection in each other's respective galaxies. There is more to the argument than this, and we will dig deeper into it in a moment, but this is a good summary of the debate. If you boil it down to its core components, you get three things. First, the UNSC and the Empire are both anti-alien to varying degrees. This connects them somewhat philosophically. Second, both organizations do horribly immoral things. When taken together with point one, this is essentially saying that they are similar enough organizations to be internally paired together. Finally, they are both fighting rebellions, and so they can find common cause with one another. These are the three points that the entirety of the argument can be anchored to, and these are the three points that I will debate against. Let's look at point number one first. The UNSC is fighting aliens, and the Empire is racist. To be fair to Holy Knight, I don't believe the point of this comparison was to say that the Empire and the UNSC are the same because of this, merely that it gave them common cause, and maybe some racist jokes that officers could tell each other in between discussions of galactic conquest. However, I'm going to dig a little deeper here and use it as evidence as to why the factions would not be able to hold a long-lasting partnership. I don't think anyone disagrees with the idea that the Empire is racist. They are basically Nazis in space, and while George Lucas never went so far as to show them leading a genocide against any particular alien species, they do have policies that favor the human race above all others. In all the Halo media I have consumed in my lifetime, I have never seen anything to indicate that the UEG holds those same tendencies. Now, let's be honest here. If you are a colonist on Harvest and a bunch of aliens came down and glassed your planet one day, and then led a 27-year holy war to make your entire race extinct, you're probably going to feel some type of way about that. And if you survive, you're probably going to teach your kids to feel some type of way about that as well. So is there going to be some generational racism against the Sangheili or the Jirohani? Yeah, probably. In fact, the marketing material for Halo 5 even introduced us to Sapien Sunrise, 
a xenophobic organization that was popular in some of the outer colonies. But, and this is crucial, those are not the decision makers of the UEG. The outer colonies have zero representation in the UEG. That was one of the main drivers behind the insurrection. And even then, there are just as many instances of people in the outer colonies working with differing alien species as hating them. During the war, the rubble was an insurrectionist colony that worked with the Kigyar. And there were several insurrectionist cells that wanted to unite with the Covenant to fight the UNSC. After the war, there were colonies that had human and Sangheili populations. Heck, Sangheili could just walk about in full armor without anyone caring on Sidra. So even the outer colonies didn't harbor enough strong resentment to permanently ban aliens. But what about the core worlds? What about the UEG? Well, we know that after the war, the UEG set up ambassadors on the Ungoy homeworld of Balaho. We know that they entered into peace negotiations with the Arbiter and a prominent Jerohami chieftain. And we know that there was a Sangheili refugee population living on Earth. It seems fair to say that the decision makers in the UEG have come to an understanding that the Covenant was lied to. At the very least, they don't have any desire to take political action against the other species of the galaxy. So if the elites of the UEG don't agree with the racist policies of the Empire, that is going to cause friction in their long-term partnership. Or at least we can say that it will not be a unifying ideology for them. I don't think we can say that the two factions are equal just because they make morally questionable decisions either. They both have dirty hands, that is true, but the reasons behind those choices are quite different. Let me mention some of the examples of corruption that Holy Knight gave for the UNSC. Not attempting diplomacy with insurrectionists before attacking them, carrying out assassinations against its own citizens, kidnapping children to turn into super soldiers, various, various amounts of war crimes, including developing bioweapons to use against the same Healy, and of course financing a rebellion against the Arbiter despite him being an ally. And yeah, these things would be universally panned across the board. Child soldiers, civilian assassination, bioweapons, all bad. But let's put them into context before we go saying that the UNSC is just as bad as the Empire. An argument could be made that when a civilian openly bears arms against their government, they stop being a civilian and become an enemy combatant. When they load trucks up with explosives and drive them into civilian populations, they stop being someone that qualifies for governmental protection and become a terrorist that the government needs to eliminate. Now. Is there a risk the government gets overzealous and abuses that authority? Absolutely. That is why the concept of due process must be fervently maintained. But the argument could be made regardless of where you fall on the issue. Creating bioweapons to be used against alien species that just fought a war of genocide against us? You know, I'm not going to say I support it, but I'm not going to say that it doesn't make sense to keep around as a possible means of destabilizing their society either. Is it a war crime? On Earth it would be. But the Covenant never agreed to the Geneva Convention. If they did, they would have been in violation of it countless times. And there are splinter factions that exist in the Halo universe. When we are talking about an invading force that killed billions of lives in a conventional war that humanity was about to lose, an argument could be made that having an unconventional means to prevent it from happening in the future isn't the worst idea. As for not using enough diplomacy with the insurrectionist, I cannot comfortably say that the UEG has never tried diplomacy. The books in the video games rarely go into what attempts were made to negotiate with outer colonies before they launched into rebellion. Politics is simply not as important to the Halo universe as it is to Star Wars. To the best of my knowledge, by the time the UNSC was deployed to a region, it was already in armed rebellion. A governing body simply does not negotiate with armed rebels. It is too late by that point. Armed rebellion must be fought by an armed response, or the rebellion must surrender without contest. You cannot negotiate with armed rebels, or you invite future rebellions. That is the nature of appeasement. Now, is it possible that UEG could have attempted more diplomacy before things got to full insurrection? It's possible. But then we have to consider the Carver findings. When you are the legitimately elected governing body, and you are faced with the idea that the insurrection will kill billions of your people, and compromise your entire economy and ability to govern your territory, you fight hard against that outcome. And if you are Dr. Catherine Halsey, and you have the ability to prevent that future for billions, if not trillions of families, by putting 75 of them through unimaginable pain, an argument could be made that the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. The UNSC makes hard choices because it lives in hard times. 
That is not how Star Wars is written. The Empire makes the same questionable choices the UNSC did, but it makes them easily because it chooses to rule by fear and oppression. It is led by a Sith Lord, and... Oh, crap. What is the one desire of the Sith? Help, help me out, Palpy. The Empire didn't come to power legitimately. It took power by launching a coup. Palpatine didn't take the throne because he wanted to save the universe. He did it because he wanted to be the man in the high castle that got to wear the big boy pants. And when people rebelled against him, he built a military power geared to do one thing. Suppress, oppress, and instill fear in his own population. A goal that they believed in so much that they built a planet-breaking superweapon with the sole purpose of using it against their own people. Fear will keep the local systems in line. Fear of this battle station. Yeah. Both of these factions are fighting rebellions, but they both go about fighting them in very different ways. The UNSC doesn't go around destroying its own colonies because they disagree with them. And before you say that they would if they had a Death Star, I tell you now that they don't need a Death Star. They have the Nova Bomb. If you've never heard of the Nova Bomb, it has only been used twice in all of Halo's media. And I am just going to read directly from the Halopedia entry for it. The first documented triggering of a Nova Bomb occurred when it was accidentally detonated by a group of Huragok stationed on the Covenant supercarrier Sublime Transcendence. The resulting explosion occurred between a Covenant outpost planet called Joyous Exaltation and its moon, Malheim scorching half of the planet and shattering the moon. The resulting winds on Joyous Exaltation flattened cities and spawned tidal waves. Radiation flooded the planet and killed everything living on it, penetrating the surface of the planet to its core. Every ship within the Nova Bomb's range, save for those on the opposite side of the planet, boiled and vaporized in an instant. The explosion was described as though, quote, a small star had erupted between Joyous Exaltation and its moon, end quote. The UNSC can easily destroy entire worlds, and they don't need a giant space station to do it. They just need a bomb and a delivery device. And here's the thing, you don't even need a weapon that powerful to put rebellions in line. If you know there is a city with strong rebellious tendencies, all you have to do is nuke that city. You don't have to destroy entire worlds to wipe a slate clean. If the UNSC wanted to, it could tactically nuke an insurrectionist cell's area of operation and be home before dinner, but it doesn't. In fact, in the entirety of the conflict between the UNSC and the insurrectionist, nuclear weapons have only been used one time outside of fleet combat, and it was not by the UNSC. The insurrectionists are the ones who used them, and they didn't blow up a shipyard or destroy a fuel depot either. No, they detonated it in a civilian city. The blast killed 2 million civilians, injured 8.3 million more, and the expectation was that millions more would die due to the radiation and or have children with birth defects. So yeah, the UNSC has done some questionable things, but the Halo universe is not written in such a way that you are supposed to look at one side as being the absolute moral authority. The Empire, on the other hand, they are written as clearly evil opponents that must be overthrown. So I think I have shown that the UNSC is not the same thing as the Empire. But let's discuss the question that started the whole thing. Would they be on the same side? I think the answer is no. Or at least they wouldn't be on the same side for long. And I think the reason for this is fairly simple. The Empire is evil. In the scenario where the Empire discovers the UEG in the UNSC during or just before the Battle of Reach, I don't think they immediately intervene. Yes, they might look at it and say it is a human government fighting aliens and we will intervene for them. They could do that. But there is human slavery carried out in hut space, and you don't see the Empire trying to ride in and play hero. While Emperor Palpatine's military tactics are questionable, he is a very strategic thinker with regard to the long game of politics. Before getting involved in any conflict, he would probably assess what is best for his own power, and assisting a democratically elected government who is fighting a losing war against both aliens and insurrectionists may be just too much of a liability. Best to see who the victor is and what state they are left in when the dust settles, 
and then clean up the remnants afterwards if they are weak enough to do so. Now, there is an alternative to that, of course, and that is that the Empire will see an opportunity to turn the UEG into a vassal state, or perhaps even include their territory in the Empire directly. That is not something I think the UEG would be able to stand for. Governments do not easily relinquish power. That is true in Halo, Star Wars, and real life. A new threat showing up and trying to tell the UNSC what's what is not how it works. If it was, there wouldn't have been an insurrection to begin with. If we have learned anything about humanity in the Halo universe, it is that they are scrappy, innovative, and willing to fight to the bitter end. Woe be to the moth tasked with bringing war to the UNSC, because that man will have more struggle on his hands than he has ever felt in his life. There is, of course, the idea that Palpatine could lie about his intentions to usurp the UEG's authority. It does seem like something he would do, claim to be on their side while playing a long game. And to that, I have only one response. The Office of Naval Intelligence. Oni is without a doubt the boogeyman of the UNSC. They are intelligent, subversive, and ruthless in how they operate. Not to mention that the UNSC AIs are quite good at intruding in foreign networks. And the Empire absolutely sucks at data security. One raid by a Spartan 2 team on an Imperial cruiser with a smart AI, and Oni learns every secret the Empire doesn't want them to know. Force deployment, weapons research. I understand. And then, Oni goes to work. Heck, within five years, the UEG might just take over the Empire. Holy Knight brought up the idea that a couple well-placed bribes would be enough to get the UEG to look past this, and that is a fair point to bring up. If Halo were written by Star Wars fans, that would be how it works. Bribes and government corruption are necessary aspects to Star Wars. They are mainstays of the IP. But that is not how it has ever been shown to work in the Halo universe. If it were, Cortana would never have launched an attack against the UNSC when she took power. She could have just manipulated the economy and put money in the hands of the right people. A utopian society is certainly an easier sell than a wrinkly oppressor in a galaxy far, far away. Now, there is one possibility that we have not discussed, and that is that the Empire has no desire to take over the UEG. If, by some means, Palpatine was willing to set aside his lust for... <laughs> Would the UNSC and Empire join up? To this, I will say, maybe. At this point in the war, the UNSC is in no position to look gift horses in the mouth. Perhaps they team up to defeat the Covenant. But what then? Both are fighting rebellions, so maybe they try to remain allies. But as previously discussed, the two factions have widely different methods for dealing with insurrectionists. The Empire offers the Death Star, the UNSC turns them down, because that's just not how they want to handle things. The UNSC witnesses the atrociously callous and inefficient means in which the Empire conducts their war against the Rebel Alliance, and cracks begin to form amongst the two military powers. Those cracks are not easily mended, and lest we forget, the UEG is a democratically elected government, the one thing that the Rebel Alliance is fighting for. Seeing a legitimately elected government that is not immediately steamrolled by the Empire may just give them an added level of hope, and as we all know, Rebellions are built on hope. In seeing how the UNSC emboldens rebels and their sympathizers, what do you think will be the next move by the military built for keeping its own populace in check? I think they make plans to kowtow the UEG. It doesn't have to be all-out war. Maybe it starts with a symbolic gesture of submitting to the Empire's racial policies. Or maybe they ask for some type of tribute to be paid to them. It might start small. But eventually, they will ask for something that the UEG cannot acquiesce to. And then the cracks begin to widen. And we get back to the scenario of the Empire planning something a little more nefarious. The point is, in the long run, the two find themselves at odds. This is, of course, just my opinion based on my analysis of the two IPs. But the truth is that these two factions could be put on the same side if a writer had a story in which they were. That is the nature of storytelling. If it is a good story, people will want to hear it. And if the writer can explain it in such a way that it makes sense, then more power to them. Maybe a writer will come along and introduce political intrigue stories that involve corruption and bribing UEG senators. Maybe the Empire will stop sucking at cybersecurity. Maybe that waterfront property in Arizona will earn me my investment back. Anything is possible in storytelling. 
But in this case, I don't think it is as simple as saying the UNSC obviously joins the Empire. I think it will take a lot more explaining than what was originally suggested. Like I said at the start of the video though, please share your own thoughts in the comments section. Do you think they could be on the same side? Or do you think the Empire is just a little too power hungry and the UNSC just a little too proud to partner up? Let the debate commence, but commence in a respectful manner. If you did enjoy this video, please bless us with a like and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already done so. For Fairly Critical, I am your host Jacob, and I will see you in the next one. Don't make it. We'll make it. It's been an honor serving you.